Welcome everyone to our spring tutor lecture featuring Tutor Tsukahara and this is not a TED talk. What it is, Tutor Tsukahara will discover to you in due course. He is a speaker who needs no introduction, especially among this crowd, except perhaps to note that at a time when the integral program could barely count to five, he showed up an economist, as we learned later, a recovering economist, <laughs> taught us how to plan, taught us how to count, taught us how to account for ourselves. Three terms as director. We'd give him a fourth if he would take it, but he won't. So with that, I give you our speaker for the afternoon, Professor Ted Sukahara, Professor of the Year. Thank you, Steve. In very typical Courtright terms, exaggerated introduction. Uh, I only served two terms as director. A third, a third would have, a third would have been suicide. <laughs> So let me uh, begin this by uh, giving some opening remarks and then we're gonna do a little bit of a slideshow once I get past the opening remarks. My responsibility this afternoon is to deliver the spring tutor lecture. I thought I could slip into retirement before it was discovered that I never volunteered for this part of our program. Well, after 20 years of artfully dodging this assignment, I was flattered into it by Tudor Art, who said to me, people want to hear what you have to say. However, he didn't give me any suggestions about a text or topic that motivates their curiosity. I think it might be they wondered if I can string together enough words for a Tudor lecture. A review of past lectures identifies that the subject selected should have a recognizable connection to a text or text in the curriculum and related to the tutor's scholarly life. There's a clue here in that last statement. A good example would be Tudor Riley's fall lecture on the Mino that drew upon his lifelong interest in classical languages. However, this research didn't lead to a logical subject for today. Most of my tutor assignments have been in the mathematics tutorial. So familiar texts would be Euclid's Elements, Apollonius's conics, Descartes' geometry, Lobachevsky's theory of parallels, or Einstein's relativity. But I'm not a trained geometer like the late Brother Raphael, and I am a physics dropout in my St. Mary's undergraduate days. So it's no surprise that my scholarly life is not in these areas. I am what Tudor Courtright would identify as an amateur an enthusiastic admirer of these subjects. I also served a rotation in the senior language that I enjoyed because I had the freedom to fill in the syllabus void created by the tutor's decision to move Kant to the junior seminar and could not agree on what to read to replace it. And I think that still goes on. They can't agree on re any kind of readings for, the, for this particular senior seminar. Reading Lao Tzu and Confucius with Plato and Aristotle, discussing Bob Hass's translation of the haiku of Basho, Busan, and Issa with him in the room, and absorbing Endo's novel Silence was enriching for me and hopefully for the students. But I am not trained in either philosophy or in the humanities. I serve as what Eva Brand, the doyen of liberal education, identifies as a tutor the master learner in the room. Yes, even old dogs can attempt to learn new tricks. I was a lover looking for another opportunity to learn more from these texts like this. Now that I have confused you, how will I fill the remaining time this afternoon? So it's time to turn to a digital text, text that I prepared for today. And so let's move to Right. So the first question, looking at this, and you'll see what's going to happen next, 
is the Tudor lecture an oxymoron or a paradox? Professors lecture. Tutors dis discuss texts with their colleagues and students. Will an answer to this question emerge this afternoon? So if you see, you've got a photo of Eva Brown and a picture, and that's the bedroom. And that's because Eva Brown was lost at St. Mary's in 2005. Her seminar used as a text, a replica of Vincent van Gogh's The Bedroom, which you see there. I went to the seminar wondering how the 90 minutes would be filled with conversations linked to the image. I left in awe of her skill to facilitate the discussion, not as an artist or a scholar of art, but to move the focus from the images to the ideas they illuminated. She is the platonic form of Tudor that we all strive to reach. So here's another slide. I'm not trying to, uh, to mimic Tudor Brown's seminar. This would require something called chutzpah. My use of the artwork is to establish a thread for our conversation. Do you recognize this photo? If you do, please raise your hand and tell me what it is. A student, please. Yeah. Okay, School of Athens. So if you recognize this as School of Athens, what can you suggest in the picture that I should concentrate on to inspire me? All right, and who is in the center or what is in the center? Okay, does anybody have any uh, other reactions to who's in the center? How about some of the other images that are in the portrait? Do you recognize them? Um, one of them is the cover of our Okay, and are all of these people likely to have been at the academy at the same time? Okay, thank you very much. So let's go to the next slide. Do you recognize this image? But those of you who are interested in green space ought to be able to figure out that this is an important piece of green space. This is from the tourist literature, what's described as the location of Plato's Academy today. And there is a sign that I couldn't capture that identifies it for tourists if you go and make the trip and you wanna say, I've been there, there it is. So let's take a look at the next slide. Do you recognize this? Most of you should. Can you translate it? This is uh, what not the non-geometry center. Yeah, this is what's supposedly at the entrance of the academy before it was demolished, right? That's what's there. So here's a confession. My Attic Greek is limited to words heard while eavesdropping on Greek one that was taught by my Cathedral High Latin four teacher, Mr. McGovern. We were in the same room in the same time block. We were not allowed to take Greek one because we were enrolled in Latin four. It sounds a little bit like the administrative guidelines we have here at the college about eavesdropping on classes. I picked up a few more words listening to the conversation in the programs and a bit of grammar from a failed attempt to learn from digital sources. I bought one of those CD things where you can learn languages on your own. Uh, the presenter was an obnoxious voice whose accent I couldn't handle. So I, uh, I think it's in the donation box. If it's outside of Tudor Ham's office, you're more than welcome to it. So this is a translation I found for the message. Is this one correct? Let no one untrained in geometry enter here. Do any of you recognize where this one comes from? This happens to be the Rosen translation on the first page in the Copernicus that most of you should have read because it's part of the readings for what, sophomore mathematics? 
My research of the evidence existing over the a portal of the Academy suggests that it's a myth that was created by ancient readers of Plato that saw important uses of geometry by him. So this is the cover of a book by Eva Braun. And in there she writes, to conclude, let me put succinctly my notions about the way a teacher should read Plato with young students. Don't lecture, don't recall doctrines, forget a timeline efficient agenda. Give some discrete direction toward the subtitles of the text, subtleties of the text, but mostly ask questions inducing students to participate in the dialogue and be in it with them. So let's read some text from Plato. And here comes my partner reader. Understand then that it is said that there are these two things, one sovereign of the intelligible kind in place and the other of the visible. I don't say of heaven, so it's not seem to you to be playing the sophist with the name. In any case, you have two kinds of things, visible and intelligible. Right. It's like a line divided into two unequal sections. Then divide each section, namely that of the visible and that of the intelligible in the same ratio as the line in terms now of relative clarity and opacity, one subsection of the visible consists of images. And by images, I mean first shadows, then the reflections in water and all, and all close packed, smooth and shiny materials and everything of that sort, if you understand. I do. Oh, good. In the other subsection of the visible, put the originals of these images, namely the animals are all around us, all the plants and the whole class of manufactured things. Considered that put. Would you be willing to say that, regards truth and untruth, the division is in this proportion. As the opinable is to the noble, so the likeness is to the thing that it's like? Certainly. I can't find evidence that Plato's older brother, Glaucon, was a member of the academy. Socrates uses terms that are familiar to geometers. Line, divide the line, unequal sections, same ratio, proportion. Do you need training in geometry to understand what Glaucon is being asked to do? Let's lead a little, read a little bit more. What happened to Socrates? Oh, I went back to my seat. <laughs> how the section of the intelligible is to be divided. How? As follows, in one subsection, the soul using as images the things that were imitated before, is forced to investigate from hypotheses, proceeding not to a first principle, but to conclusion. In the other subsection, however, it makes its way to a first principle that is not a hypothesis, proceeding from a hypothesis, but without the images used in the previous subsection, using forms themselves and making its investigation through them. I don't yet fully understand what you mean. So now a question for you. Did you notice footnote 12 in the handout? If you don't have the handout, this is, comes from the volume that most of you already have of the Plato. I can't find evidence that Plato used footnotes. So the author of it must be Professor Cooper, the editor of the Plato co collection that you have for first year students. Visually, this is the longest footnote in book six because the line is illustrated in an upright position. Is this footnote necessary to understand the text we have just read so far? Does it help you remember the concept of proportion? Does it identify the use of the divided line? The next slide, the is a slide of Daniel Allen. I don't know if many of you recognize Daniel Allen. Uh, you should learn to recognize her. She's a candidate for governor in the state of Massachusetts, having taken leave from her chair at Harvard. Of course, she runs a major program in ethics. Uh, I am a fan of Danielle Allen's because she grew up in Claremont, California at the same time my children did. And I wondered why it wasn't fortune that would have put my children in class with her in kindergarten. But this is one of the reasons I'm a fan of Daniel Allen. So let's go in 
take a look at what uh, we have to say here about her. Daniel Allen, the author of Why Plato Wrote, began her Attic Greek studies at Princeton during her undergraduate days. She was a student of Professor Cooper. She earned a DPhil in classics from King's College and Cambridge University. And I'm fond of that reference because the one college I remember in Cambridge is King's College where uh, we were at a conference right after I got my PhD. And the remarkable privilege the tutors have there, they could walk on the grass. That sign was just marvelous to see. So let's compare her presentation of the divide line to his. Right, this is from her book and it's hard to read, but this is what uh, she's got there. Uh, if you have trouble reading this, uh, you can buy the book. I think it would be helpful. Uh, Alan provided these image to help us understand the mathematical trick that Socrates used with the divided line. How long is the line in the image? Nine units. What results from the unequal division of the line? Six units and three units. What is the ratio of the division? Six to three. Now investigate the visible section, divide it into the same ratio, two to one. Investigate the intellible section, divide it into the same ratio, four to two. Does Allen's model of the divided line make Socrates' example clearer for you than Cooper's footnote? The original ratio is six to three. Six is transformed to four to two, three to two to one. Allen's example in proportion is in her text, four to two, two to one. And all of those two dots, and there's no, not a four dot separation in her presentation. But Euclid students might recognize this better as four, two dots, two, four dots, two, two dots, one. The consequent of the first ratio is the same number as the antecedent in the second term. So back, let's go back to Alan. And this is a direct quote for, no, up the other way. All right, this is from her text. Now, if you look closely at these sections of the line, you'll notice that Socrates has played an, an interesting trick. The middle two sections of the line are equal in length. This means that the objects being cognizized in each of the domains must be of equal value. In fact, they are not. They are equal in value, yet even though the same set of ob objects. All the wor world's material artifacts which are available to be cognizized in the, cognizized in the do domain of belief are also available to be cognizized in the domain of thinking. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, nope. I forgot the question. Can we infer from Allen's image of the divided line that the proportion illustrated represents a three term formulation of a proportion that's A to B as B to C? Does it describe the same set of objects? If Cooper's draftsman was careful, then the image in footnote 12 visually presents the middle two segments as equal but different. If so, this would be an image of a four-term form formulation of a proportion, A to B, C to D. Are these observations bringing back fond memories of reading Euclid's elements in the first year mathematics tutorial? Perhaps the next slide, which is up on the screen, will refresh your memory. And these are definitions of, from book five. A ratio is a sort of a relationship in respect to size between two magnitudes of the same kind. Definition five, define the same ratio, implies there are four magnitudes identified in most cases. Defin definition six, let magnitudes which have the same ratio be called proportional. A proportion in three terms is the least possible. That's definition eight. So in some ways, the vocabulary that you wanna keep in mind of ratio and proportion you have carried over from your own first year experience with Book, book five of Euclid, and I think everybody gets there. It used to be in the older days, we barely got through book four. All right, so let's go to a final text from Plato. And Socrates is awake. And one of us, thus, there are four such conditions in the soul, corresponding to the four subsections of our mind, understanding to the highest, 
thought for the second, belief for the third, and imagining for the last. Arrange them in a ratio and consider that each shares in clarity to the same degree that the subsection is set over shares in truth. I understand, agree, and arrange them as you say. And before I go to the next part of this, I want to thank Anthony for being Socrates. I looked out at the photo outside my office in Garaventa and realized that we needed to have a better image of Socrates than what I've been looking at for the last 15 years. <laughs> and so Anthony came to mind that he would give us a view that we should be looking at Socrates as a gorgeous young man than sort of an ugly old guy hanging on the wall. So this is for Socrates, who may be fictional in some minds. <laughs> okay, Alan knows the conclusion of book six of the Republic. So her proportion must be in four magnitudes, A to B, C to D. The geometry in Plato's Academy was a primitive model of the axiomatic method that Euclid would produce. Geometry evolved from practical construction methods developed by non-Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Chinese, and Indians, to logic-dependent propositions developed by the Pythagoreans that became central to the development of Platonic ideas. Can anyone versed in geometry in this pre-Euclidean world actually perform the division of the line and the segments? In other words, the question is, could anyone actually produce the divisions of that particular line in the ratios as articulated in the Plato text uh, by either formulation that you have, uh, that we have in the footnote or in Alan's formulation? So I went to try to solve this problem and we'll go to one of the sources. Hilda Hudson is the image on there. She's, this is about a hundred years ago. And the book cover is from a purchase I made from the University of California's uh, massive collection of reprints of things. Uh, it took a while to find it, but it was interesting to get. And it's called Ruler and Compass. And so let's take a look at something from Hudson's book. All right, this is directly from her. At the beginning of his elements, you could place his three postulates. Let it be granted that a straight line may be drawn from one point to any other point. That a terminated straight line may be produced to any length in a straight line. That a circle may be described with from center at any distance from that center. And the, all the constructions used in the first six books are built up from these operations alone. The first two tell us what Euclid can do with his ruler or straight, straight edge. It can have no great graduations, so he does not carry it to a distance from a position to a point to another, only to draw straight lines and produce them. So then the question comes up for your memory. Do you recall any constructions required for propositions in book five of the elements that covers the geometry of ratio and proportions? I can't find any in my last trip through book five, so, and I cheated because I only looked for the code QEF, which I think we've gotten as a code that this says there was a construction going on. So none exist as far as I look at my copy, the green line version of the Euclid. So can we conclude then we do not require a ruler compass to provide the needing, needed information for the proofs in book five? I think that's what it begins to say. So then I went looking. I cannot find evidence that the compass was used in pre-Euclidean period, but certainly the ruler or straight edge instrument was available to geometers. Would that, be, would that instrument be enough to provide all the divisions of the line required by Socrates? So again, it's a question, if could you do the actual deconstruction of the line into the given ratios with the tools that were permitted at that time. So as to wrap up, many of you may still be confused as to what my goal was this afternoon. It should be evident that I was unwilling to profess to lecture on a subject. 
So my search for a topic began with questions that students have raised in which I have not provided very adequate answers for them. An example to a question, what is a magnitude? And are numbers an example of magnitude? These are questions students logically raise when they begin book five of Euclid's Elements because magnitude has not been defined yet or discovered in previous books. Students also raise the question, aren't ratios fractions? Book seven provides a definition for number that depends on earlier definitions of unit. However, is this enough to establish fractions? The review of student questions unanswered adequately led to my own questions about the discussion of the divided line that seemed to be influenced by Cooper's footnote and my misunderstanding of proportion using arising in these discussions. I found some notes that another tutor had assembled from Brand's book that provided proof of the divided line using algebra and geometry based on triangles. So I was confident that Tudor Cartwright would have a copy of the music of the Republic. So I went up to his office and I borrowed it from him to validate the Tudor's notes that I had just established were not his summary based on documents, how the documents were organized. After reading the section on the divided line, it was a book that I needed to buy. Amazon delivered it quickly. Her essay on reading Plato jogged my memory of Alan's book that I had on my office shelf and that had a similar number-based discussion of the divided line. A rereading of chapter three of Allen led to the question of what is the content of geometry before Euclid's elements? Students have asked why the program doesn't read any works by women in the mathematics tutorial. A chance reference connecting Albert Einstein to Emily Nuther led to a search of pub her published works to see if any could be added to the senior mathematics tutorial. Her work in abstract algebra was far too difficult to read. However, further reach, research led to Hilda Hudson and my failed attempt to see what I could produce, if I could produce the segment cut ratio of the divided line with a straight and ledge edge only. Just for a footnote, there is a nice uh, website at Agascot College that gives you a list of uh, women mathematicians and their works. So if you get curious, go there and look. Uh, that's essentially how I found Hilda Hudson. And the Agnes Scott connection has an integral link to it because a former integral student was a philosophy instructor at Agnes Scott. He's now at the College of Worcester and that's Lee McBride. So it was, you know, it was nice to be able to pull things together that has some home connection to it all. A proper title for today's remarks is Therapy for a Tutor. The request to provide these remarks has helped me clarify questions I had about Plato and given me incentive to reread him again in toto beginning this summer. Please let me know if you would like to join me. Thank you for your presence this afternoon and please raise new questions or make comments in this time we have remaining together this afternoon. So I'll make a comment. The Emily Noether was an interesting reference. There was, I went looking, there is a, an, a, what is it? An obituary commentary by Albert Einstein when she died that was interesting to read. The reason there is a connection between the two, she was at Bryn Mawr College. She was a refugee from Europe. Albert Einstein, of course, was at Princeton and that's the separation of about 50 miles. So there's every good reason to believe that they had stayed in touch after they both came to the United States. Uh, the uh, statement that Einstein writes about her is glowing. And that's why I got curious if there's anything accessible by her. The other fact about her that's interesting is she is buried at Bryn Mawr College where she uh, taught when she came to the United States. And I regret that the, the time that I spent on that campus uh, as a parent of a student who was graduating from that school. I, uh, I think I must have walked by more than once where she's buried and I never took notice. 
So I think if I ever find myself back on the main line of Philadelphia, I'll have to go see where she is because this has all sparked that curiosity. This is amazing. It's the typical inter interval class silence. It generally says that you haven't read the text. Or there's a few that have only read parts of the text and it wasn't what we were talking about. Or I'm taking advantage of the silence to very quickly read the text. In the <laughs> and and oh, David? Could you talk a little bit more about your understanding of Danielle Allen's this idea that once we get the line all the way divided into four, two, two, one, she says that the two equal segments in the middle are, they're not just equal to one another, they're identical to one another. And it sounds like, so what I don't understand is how she can claim that when it doesn't, it doesn't look like they're numerically identical. Right, so is it somehow, I, and I get that she's saying that like these the objects are being cognized by thinking on the one side and cognized by imagination on the on the other, but I'm not 100% sure how that makes them not just equal, but identical. Well, my, my puzzle goes deeper than Alan's formulation. It's e even Cooper's. Uh, in order to do what they're doing, you're talking about a finite line and I'm baffled how you can take the, uh, the imagination category and limit it. And so once I saw that, I'm saying, how can you even perform the division? So all of this argument I see is analogical in, in the text. And so I think this is where the freedom Allen has to match it up. Uh, I, I tend to agree with her that you can't imagine something you've never seen. And so I think that's how she's doing the one-to-one -one match in that section. But then again, if uh, you know, Gracia and I were going to try to do this uh, when Gracia was still in our midst regularly, and she decided to retire before I did, so with the project never got finished. But it was uh, one of the incentives to try to read a little bit of Greek that I don't have to see if there's something just in the language itself that will give us a clue because we're just taking both of these in translation and how the translator interprets the particular part of it. I have a question from the Zoom audience, uh, particularly Sam Dixon asks, uh, what has kept you inspired mathematically over the years? Well, that's from Sam. <laughs> it, is. it is from Sam. Uh, Sam, first of all, I haven't found the comments to your draft essay. I'll go look for them when I get, get home. Sam sent me that email about an hour ago and I, I went looking for it and then got stuck doing this. Uh, <laughs> math has been something that's been a friend. Uh, a friend in a sense has been a, 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 an item that's helped me move from job to job because I've discovered as I've gotten older, the, the employment I was facing required more understanding of mathematics than most jobs when I was an undergraduate. And so it was really sort of the wild card that allowed me to move from original career choice to something else when I needed to make a change. And it's the path that got me from business, which was, I was a business major here, and get me from a business major to at one point where I was almost at the forefront of theoretical economics with not much formal mathematics that I had acquired very adequately as a student. So being able to sort of learn it and understand it before the masses got there made me look smarter than I really am. And so you have to be at the right place at the right time to leverage the kind of math history I've had, but I like the fundamental discipline of Euclid. I mean, Euclid has given me a way to read things 
with a little bit more care and understanding than I had when I was, again, as an undergraduate where we just read things. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that particular drawback uh, draw into this thing. So that rambling answer to the Sam's question is just a clue. I've been struggling to write another talk that some of you might come to on Friday. So uh, you might be uh, amused at where I end up with that talk. I do have something about my checkered career path in there, but I may scrub it because it's quite embarrassing. My wife will know that I've had more than one career and I've had more than one opportunity to make a change in my careers uh, over conditions that I've never been able to control adequately. Uh, part of it is because I can't make up my mind what I really want to pursue in depth. Now, the, I'll give another footnote. Uh, David's question about Danielle, uh, Danielle Allen it is a, um, a reason to give her another book. There's a book she's written on, on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you should read the book. It is a great read, particularly if you're trying to understand the value of reading a document like that carefully and how it translates into what we're doing in the United States now. And it's, it's something that was put together because she and her then husband were involved in doing uh, basically education for people who would not be able to get educations. It was a after hours project when they were at the University of Chicago. Uh, and it just shows you what you can do with good material to help people learn and liberate themselves. And I don't get a cut of the royalties. I, I didn't want to be upfront about that too. For David's question, the middle sections of the line are, they can be numbered numerically, but they can be drawn and seen first without making it so Same way you craft a musical. So how are they equal? There. Well, that's that's the question. If if you take a look at the visible and invisible, are they really of the same thing? I don't look at it that way. If you look at it as the line and parts of a line, they have to be the same thing. So by assumption, you force the possibility of coming up with proportion. But as you read the particular argument of visible and invisible, it doesn't fit into the nature of proportion the way I read it. But that's just because I may be too rigid in the way I'm looking at it. But when you cast it as number, you're saying they are of the same kind. The, so the number is of line and not the Yep. So by the assumption that it is a line, you're basically saying the parts of the line are of the same kind. They're magnitudes. I have to hook. So how is it so how is a belief like arguing based on hypothesis? Yeah, I'll take my guide off question or no. Look at ask another question. Okay, I have one from the audience uh, from Alfonso Mendoza asks, can imagination be quantified? I don't think so. <clears throat> uh, 
But I would also argue you can't have imagination without some experience to imagine. So, so you have to have something you've sensed to be able to trigger it. Uh, so in some ways, I've always been a skeptic about reading science fiction. Yeah. You know, it, to me, science fiction is more creative nonfiction. So yeah, his, his question, imagination, the same reason I say it's not limited. So, But again, remember my disclaimer, I am not a philosopher, I'm not a humanist, I just happen to be an economist. And when I was going through graduate school, economists had this idea that they actually knew all the answers. The rest of the people involved, the politicians and the like, uh, they had to listen to us. I remember giving a talk to an undergraduate class so the only thing economists would recognize is the one authority above them using the example, the economists are cardinals in the church. There is a Pope, we'll recognize that we elect the Pope. And so it's taken me a long time to understand the, the economists have to uh, learn to unlearn what they were taught in graduate school. Interesting when you say imagination needs something physical to be built off of. Is that where you first? Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. No, I, I, I'm, I'm really saying that you can't imagine something that you haven't had some experience with. I mean, what, you can create something from that, but if you peel it back, it's something. Right. And I think that's the connection that's actually being made between the visible and the invisible. So, so that part's nice. The other one is, uh, I, I'm back thinking about this section of the Plato. I don't know why at the college, we don't read this section for all the students but we go to the cave piece as the thing is the be all and end all. That makes no sense to me. In fact, the more you read that particular piece, the allegory of the cave, without this one, this answers some of the questions that should pop up. And there's this sort of going back and reading Plato carefully and reading more of it than we do for most of the students, I think is a necessary direction to go. But well, it's easier to get in, I think, this is just a reaction, but I think this is right. But it's easier to get into the idea of a value-laden epistemology, which is what the cave gets you, right? Because we we think of intelligence as a good and that you get better at knowing things by becoming enlightened and so forth. That's a that's probably an easier lift than the divided line, which in a way is a normative metaphysics, right? It says that there are actually better kinds of things. Um, so if we're looking for something that more people can digest more easily, that's probably why we head in the direction of the cave. But it's a shame we don't do both. A, yeah. It's a shame we don't read a lot of things, <laughs> at least in the current curriculum that uh, I had as a, general student, not an integral student. When I was here, we read far more as a business major required to take this truncated version of the classics that the integral students did twice or three times as much. I think it served me well to have what I had. I'm not sure we're doing our students justice with what we're asking them to do. That's a commercial. <laughs> Think of the lion cave, you would think of they're covering the same ground in different ways. And 
that would be an example of how the middle sections of the divided line can be thought of as equal, not just quantitatively, but as in, in importance of getting the ideas across. What principle gave that they correspond to? Well, um, I guess when you're walking shadows, you're in the shadow watching uh, part of the divided line. You're going to use icons, A pass C, and then you get your head turned to their how. But then you're you're seeing the things that the, where the shadows came from. That looks like when you start believing things and guessing things, pissed. <clears throat> then you have to try to climb out of it. And that sounds like the third stage. You don't know where you're going. One, it's a hard climb. It's a uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my memory is recovering. I think the notes that I was referring to came from a file that Tudor Riley passed on to me about 15 years ago that I found as I was cleaning out a drawer in my office. <clears throat> so you have two kinds of analogies. One's mathematical, one is so the the two different accounts, the line and the cave, cover the same material in slightly different ways. Is that similar to the middle sections of the line as the equator? Okay. So the middle the middle sections also cover the same ground in a different way. Yeah, interesting. So then, I guess we don't have to talk about this question, but where where would the upper and lower parts of the line be the more public uh, corresponding to those? Is it is it like what comes before the line? Um, is the shadows, then the line is the, the line is the, uh, what is it called, statues that they move across, the cave is the trees and things in the real world, um, and then whatever comes after the cave is the sun. Is that an okay way of thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, that sounds that's how we present it. Okay, it makes sense to map that on to what <clears throat> Tudor Tukahara said about this goes together with the idea that it's hard, it's hard to imagine something without funding your imagination with prior experience. Right, because when the slaves are in the cave, right, they are they are only experiencing shadows, right. So even their imagination is only funded with shadows, and their cognizing faculties that are for better things remain entirely dormant, right, because they've never been presented with anything else. So it's only when they turn their heads and see the statues or the puppets, depending on the translation that you see, that a higher form of cognition engages because they're running into a higher form, literally a higher form of, of thing, of, of, of way of being. And then as they get dragged up, it sort of follows along. So, so I think what Evan was uh, talking about is uh, 
an opportunity. I don't know what you're doing this summer, but remember my offer. If you're interested in reading this, we can do it as a set of Zoom conversations because it's a it's a nice piece. I think if I'm and Tudor Cartwright can remind me. I think the middle section we're talk, talking about six and seven. There's actually three books in the middle of the Republic that can be read together for comprehension. I think that's what Everett Brown's argument is, that they're sort of pockets that, that connect. So by lifting something out of one, doesn't give you the complete message she's, she believes Plato is trying to articulate. So, you know, re, this has been an incentive to reread it. And some of you, you know, why you got the volume from the program, the complete works, you should read the complete works. Uh, if you don't, then you've not gotten the full value of your education uh, because we're not to read it all in the tutorials together. You have the freedom and the opportunity to read at your own pace to absorb them. And I think it's interesting to, to go through and begin to see when Plato emerges clearly from what he creates earlier with Socrates as a what I often think of as a foil for, for Plato. So, but it's something I like to do. Yeah, Liz? Yeah, I, I'm still thinking about the question of, about the two middle sections of the line, how they're the same, and uh, thinking about the end of the list, the belief and thought is how they're labeled here. And I was also thinking about how you pointed out that in the original, the, the original manuscript, but how this is a footnote from Cooper where we see the, the diagram. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, so the, the diagram looks to me like part of the visible realm, uh, not the invisible realm. But if there was no diagram in the text, then maybe I would have thought of that passage differently. I would have said that that's thought. It's not an original or a belief. So can you, I don't know, what do, what do you think? Can you, maybe it's re-asking David's question about how those two middle sections are the same but not the same is the is the divided line is it a thought or is it part of is it part of the visible realm or the invisible realm yeah again that that's the puzzle of the the role of the translator and all of this and what triggered that is having try, trying to get a, a little bit more view of cooper in some of the lectures he did and that was prompted by a lecturer we had here last fall I remember the fellow that was the Sather lecturer that was here. So in reading his works, uh, I went to see what the other lecturer series was and Cooper was in it. And so I was curious to how he was making his arguments. So when I got to this, I just wonder if we simply concentrate on the footnote, we're not doing as much work as we should with the text. And that's really what I think the whole drive is. If you're working from translation, at least be faithful to that particular piece. Don't let the editor get in the way. The better way to go at it is if you've got the skills to do the translation yourself. So this is why I like Bob Hass's work on, on the Japanese. Uh, when I started talking about Bob and I are old classmates. So this is one of the reasons that I tend to bring him up. He's someone I've looked at who's shown me what you can do with an education if you work at it. Bob translated much of this almost character by character. He taught himself Japanese characters one day at a time. And so he went in to make the translation from the Japanese to the English, except you can find Bobisms in the translation. Some of the words he uses in the translation clearly are too modern. And when I asked Bob about this, he fessed up that, yeah, he had to say it a little bit better because Bob, Bob has a flair. I mean, this is, you know, I just really enjoyed what he did. 
because it triggered my interest after listening by a lecture by him for one of the original research projects I worked on when I got here, which is how do men care for their elderly parents? That's one of the essays that he translated. So, um, you know, if you take the opportunity to listen to others, you get a chance to expand your own particular interests. Uh, if you get locked into just, this is all I'm gonna do because this is all I'm assigned, but you're losing an opportunity to grow. Oh, did, did, did I forget a slide? I'm, I must have. I'm sure I did. Yeah, would you, would you slide? I, I'm sorry. Thanks, Will. I just got my mind up. There is one slide I thought I, I needed to. Uh, this, this, this was purposeful. I, it was sort of an afterthought after I put the presentation together. And I came down to this. Why these four brothers? They're brothers that have been involved with the program for ages. Uh, Brother Brendan uh, is somebody that I knew as a student. Uh, I took a math course from Brother Brendan, but his heart was in interval. And the bench out here uh, has the phrase on it. And that's what got me to take a look at what was the representation. The, the, the bench Greek is not correct for the period. And so that was one of the things that triggered it. Brother Donald has put together notes for the sophomore mathematics that have been wonderful. He did a lot of work to give enrichment materials for tutors. That's gonna get passed on when I retire to the next tutor who does sophomore mathematics. Of course, brother Raphael is, a, I consider him a, a soul brother, uh, partly because we used to have coffee together in his office almost daily. Uh, he was the director before me and trained me in what I should and should not do. And so I credit him for making me appreciate the discipline that geometry can give you. And Brother Martin just loved Lobachevsky. I mean, he, anytime he had an opportunity to do the senior math, he'd jump at it. You'd almost have to fight him uh, to get him away from that. Uh, and, and so these are four, I think, uh, people that the program should continue to remember. And this is also a commercial for Friday. There is going to be a little bit more of my thoughts about the value of the brothers on this campus that I think we need to uh, remind people about. So any, thank you. I think it's time for us to get ready to uh, have a snack or two. Thank you everybody. <laughs>